Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Wired for Talent, a podcast here at Henkel, and my name is Adil Ansari. Today, with my colleague Dorothy Knowles, we'll be talking to an expert for talent acquisition called Daniel Torres, and we'll be talking about how the trends in the industry for talent has changed over the last couple of years. So let's get into it. Right, so we have two really distinguished guests today on this podcast, and I'd like them to introduce themselves. Perhaps we start with our lady in on the left corner, Dorothy Knowles. Can you give us a quick introduction? Yes, thank you, Adil. Thank you for having me, having us here today on this podcast. Um, my name is Dorothy, like you already said, and I work for Henkel, and I'm responsible for talent attraction and experience for our Germany and Switzerland organization. Perfect. So me and my team, with a lot of passion, we're driving various people and culture topics nice. within the organization. Great. And Daniel, maybe you want to give us a quick introduction of yourself as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for hosting me here at Henkel in Dusseldorf. It's been great to be here, see the, the facilities, the, the factories and everything. It's been pretty exciting. Um, so my name is Daniel Torres. Some will know me as the co-host of the FMCG Guys podcast. Um, and apart from that, my day job is actually being a, a headhunter, uh, specialized in consumer goods and retail and working for international brands across um, different countries and for um, yeah, companies in these industries at the, at the relatively senior level, so direct level and above. Perfect. And most of you probably already know me as well, but my name is Adil Ansari. I've been in Henkel now for a little over 13 years worked in the Middle East as well as now in Germany in global roles as well as regional roles. And I've always been an enthusiast when it comes to podcasts and radio. So I've done about six years actually when I was in Pakistan on radio. Had a different name back then on radio, but oh, it's always notice. yeah, it's always an interesting cool. thing. We're filled with a lot of talent in the organization across the board, I think. So Today's uh, podcast I thought was interesting because what I wanted to try and do is bring in the knowledge base from the outside world as well as the inside world when it came to talking about talent. And as you know, we are probably one of those few generations that have gone through um, a very disruptive phase in our life as a pandemic came um, the COVID. What I want to understand is, and Doro, let's start with you. How has the pandemic, if at all, changed the way in which we're looking at talent acquisition in the organization? Yeah, yeah. thank you for that question, Adil. And, and I, I think you just, you said even more, right? So we're living really in crazy times right now. It's, it's pretty chaotic. We have like political instabilities, economic uncertainties and changes, organizational changes mm -hmm. and changes all over the world. And then also things like climate change and then also pandemic. Yes. <laughs> no, so, not a moment of boredom. No, not, not a moment of boredom. So, so much is going on and so much is keeping us organizations busy. Yeah. And I mean, if we, if we think especially about the pandemic, of course, that did a lot about how, how organizations engage, I think, engage employees. How do we come together? Mm -hmm. um, is it like physically in the office, be it also working mobile from home, mm -hmm. but also above that or beyond that, there's so much more happening. Yeah. And this does something with, with us and on, on so many layers. And it's changed so much the way we worked before versus now. And I'll yeah. get into this, but I want to have that same question to you as well, yeah. Daniel, yeah. because during this pandemic, how has the, let's say, job environment or the requirements from the businesses changed in your view? I mean, it's, it's a very long answer and there's like so many layers to that. First, I wanted to mention in terms of like talent and before and after the pandemic. I mean, for me, the big change, like just seeing like from where we were in 2019 to now, mm -hmm. it's been actually probably a disengagement between company between talent or employees and the company like before we saw or used i used to be talking to candidates and they'd be like very engaged with their companies you know their mission and the day-to-day -day job connected it with their mission and stuff i think that the fact at the beginning of the pandemic there was actually a very high engagement right yeah. because it was kind of wow we're all in the same boat mm -hmm. it was the first time that kind of c-level people 
and entry level people were all working from home. Mm. So everybody, and everybody was confused, right? Yeah, <laughs> but everybody was kind yeah. of like, um, we got to get through it. Everybody together. rallied around it, you know, yeah. and and you could see people like at the sea level with their kids around, which was yeah. being unheard of. We yeah. saw like suits kind of disappeared and everybody being more informal yeah. and so on. So that was at the beginning. But then as things carried on and as we went through what two plus years of working from home, mostly there was a disengagement between what had like the the company's mission and so on with their employees day to day. So that's been a big one for me, I think. I think that's an interesting one to actually touch upon because I was talking to someone recently and they gave me a piece of information that kind of surprised me. Most of the people that are coming out of the job uh, of the universities into the job market has have never worked from an office environment because they came out during the pandemic. So they never knew how it was like working in an office environment. So my question probably would be three years down the line now, how is the work from home looking like in organizations such as ours in Henkel? Uh, how does the top management view it? How does the middle and uh, lower management view it? What are your uh, understanding on this? Yeah. I mean, if we look, for example, at what Henkel is doing right now, and um, I mean, when we talk about uh, the, the consequences of the pandemic and how we work, and we're just touching on the topic of mobile working, right? Mm -hmm. And I think mobile working is always like the theme when we talk about these changes. And, and at Henkel, we're looking at this a little bit more holistically. And also, I personally look at this a little bit more holistically. I think there are several components to it. So on the one hand, it's about of course, uh, thinking about the situation, where do we work? Mm -hmm. Is it an office environment? Is it a home office environment? Is it a co-flex office working environment? Yeah. Is it uh, the workcation topic that we also <laughs> hear frequently everywhere? It's, it's really a trend also these days. True. And everybody wants to like sip cocktails and sit with their laptop somewhere on the beach. And, and all these trends, we kind of need to figure out how we can make this happen. And as, uh, this is one component, but at the same time, of course, we also need to think about, OK, I don't think that offices are going to disappear. I think mm. we need to find a way to make them more fun, more engaging, mm. like really creating this environment where mm. everybody can can thrive in terms of having the right facilities, having the right elements, having the opportunity to connect in person yeah. with the colleagues, but also like virtually with the ones who are maybe at home or maybe yeah. on the vacation or whatever. And I think that is actually one of those things that has really changed uh, never before had i seen invites with an uh, a teams meeting a digital meeting already part yeah. of the invite we always had a room and you knew yeah. that if somebody wasn't able to make it we would make that extra step to include yeah. that yeah. Uh, link but speaking from what daniel talked yeah. about do you foresee this kind of change in mindset of you know that motivation initially we were all in the same boat and then suddenly, because it's three years, probably, yeah. you know, fatigue sets in as well. Has that kind of link with the mission been something that you've had to focus on over the years as well to try to keep that link alive? Yeah, to, to, to really make sure that everybody has the same feeling. We're mm -hmm. into this together. I think I, I would say that, and I'm not, I'm just not would say, I mean, in the end, it's really about finding the right workplace where everybody can thrive, right? And, and, and like I said earlier, we focus so much on, on this mobile mm. situation and I and then I, I added a little bit onto that. Mm. There are more things like also how do we deal with, with health topics in the organization? Absolutely. Is this all, in the end, it's a big cycle yeah. and where we need to make sure that everybody feels uh, feels safe and I think and, and, and healthy in the end and, and happy with, with everything because, I mean, in the end, the, the entire discussion also about the flexibility that we need to have at work, it comes from somewhere. I mean, we all have also life next to our Absolutely. work, next to Henkel, for example. So yeah. it's really also about creating this work-life balance. So it goes actually beyond only the fact, okay, where do I work? But it's really also about um, how do we work in general? And what do we have mm -hmm. for, for methods to come together in terms of flexible work arrangements, That's true. Uh, sharing positions, all these kind of things. This, this really plays a role. How do we interact with teams? How do we come together in agile teams, project mm -hmm. teams? Mm -hmm. I think also moving along the, the timeline, like yeah. you suggested, 
I think lots of things are going to change in terms of how we work and also how teams come together, maybe more on a project base sometime in the future where you have more a start and an mm -hmm. end and where you can regroup and where you can also explore a different kind of styles. True. In mm -hmm. terms True. Of working. And actually that's uh, one of those things that I would like to get an, uh, a sense of from the outside world. I know, Daniel, you work a lot with the, the top management and senior middle management. Mm -hmm. How do they perceive the challenges when it comes to work from home? Is that something that you see as being a competitive advantage for uh, corporations such as uh, Henkel? Or do you see this as something that's a fad and it will go away? Yeah, so I think that at the begin going back again to the beginning of the pandemic where everybody was rallying mm -hmm. and working from home, mm -hmm. a lot of companies very publicly said, everybody's going to be remote from now on. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it's going to work. That's not the consensus anymore, clearly. Yeah. Like, Even the big IT companies, and you know, they said it very openly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't work personally in IT, so I don't have that much context there, but I think that they're not, they're not working completely yeah. from home. I think some people are remote. But in general, for, you know, for people to be engaged in a company and for talent to be retained and to ultimately perform, they need to like be breathing and living the culture. Mm. And that in most company cultures means like FaceTime. Yeah, it means like being present, being around your colleagues, having the, those ideas that only come up when you're in person and that yeah. engagement. So long story short, what I think to attract talent, it's going to be much more challenging if you don't have like some type of flexibility. Mm -hmm. I do think that working from an office environment and having that very clear thing, even if it means compromise on certain talent, mm -hmm. will be a competitive advantage for companies. Interesting. So. Basically, what you're saying is that a hybrid situation is going to be perhaps more of a competitive uh, edge than an all-round remote Definitely. opportunity. That's very interesting. How, how do you see that, uh, Doro, in our um, acquisition uh, you know, topics when we're looking at hiring new people? Where do you place Henkel within this realm of complete remote to hybrid to office? And I know certain jobs require to be in place, but others might require remote. Where does Henkel see itself within the yeah. spectrum? Yeah, I, I think at Henkel we really have uh, like the cool opportunity that we can have, that we can choose from the flexible and mobile working opportunities. So mm -hmm. we people can work from home, people can work from somewhere somewhere else. We have, for example, this. 30 days cross border where you can mm -hmm. work from everywhere in the world, which is, cool. which is really cool. That's amazing. And uh, not just in Europe, so really all the continents that we have. Which and is, it's not time bound. It's so not it's not like bound. you have to be in the same time zone exactly. as your job. Yeah, I, for example, have an employee in my team who, whose family is in Peru. So amazing. he goes on a regular basis wow. and, and it's, it's awesome. So um, I think this is something that's, um, that's really great and that people are using more and more. Um, yeah, but I think in the end, it's um, when we think about okay, also talent and being more uh, attractive in comparison to maybe other mm -hmm. companies. It's this. I think it's like I mentioned also earlier. I think this is really man component. But when we think about like the company culture in general, this is getting so much more important. And mm -hmm. of course, this is again a component of it. But there is so much more. I think when and also I think due to the pandemic and also caused by the pandemic, where we. Maybe people were used to be in the office all the time where people or maybe some so-called leaders were able to control maybe a little bit <laughs> yeah. more. Um, all these things were changing, right? So, and I think when we look at company culture now and especially also looking at attracting talents and especially also younger generations, the expectations are changing. Absolutely, yeah. so, that is true. And I mean, I just picked on the topic leadership, right? So we really need to create this also, I would say more eye on eye level mm. sort of leadership mm. um, relationship with, with employees having more of a role in terms of a visionary versus a manager who is just controlling maybe task by task, is it completed or not? Because this is also somehow not possible anymore. Yeah, so true. we need to put much more trust. And, and, and Trust and is such a yeah. underestimated asset within mm. an organization and even within a team. And taking from that point, both of you touched upon culture. Mm -hmm. um, within a digital world, is it more difficult to create a company culture than it was in the past? Well, I think that we're going into a world where everything is very uh, liquid, Meta. liquid, as they say as well. <laughs> like everything is like very relative, harder to grasp. Everything changes very much quicker. So I think that definitely it's harder than it was because before life was 
in some ways simpler or more mm. straightforward. It was like home office, home office, home office. That was yeah. what you did every day. If you were hired by Henkel and you lived in Hamburg, well, you moved to Dusseldorf. No? Mm-hmm. Unless you worked for the office that's up in Hamburg. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but in general, that's how it worked. And, and you know, you work to live mm-hmm. in general, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so now we're in a very different world and that's coming. The and the boundaries have yeah. kind of like blurred. Yeah. I remember in the initial days, it was difficult for me to understand where does my work stop and where does my home life begin? Um, and um, to be fair, I think the bosses, the leaders, uh, the top management had a challenge to try and also understand mm. that there is this flexibility required in the way in which we value our uh, time and the time of our uh, team members. Mm. So I remember I had written a post about, you know, lockdown and working mm-hmm. with toddlers. And one of the senior management people said, this is a very valid point and we need to take it up. And true to his word Mm -hmm. he actually had a session with everybody saying guys you know what your projects are Mm -hmm. work on what you need to work on and find the time within the day to match the timelines that you need that flexibility Mm -hmm. that openness from top management creates such trust in the team that motivation immediately goes up even for those who are probably not having kids they still feel that you know uh, the feeling that okay we need to be there for our team members so with that like you know the way in which the culture uh, impacts and the question that i asked for daniel that boss actually made an effort in a digital landscape to connect everybody Mm. together how do you see endoro right now is it something that's still uh, an area that we have to work on or some of the let's say leaders in our organization are already there and Mm. great role models i actually really like that you that you took this example mm-hmm. because we were like, I mean, earlier we were discussing about, okay, company culture and the digital world. How does it all work? How yeah. does it all come together? And then you just gave an example which works in the digital work, what, mm-hmm. when the digital world, but it also works in the normal yeah. world, in the <laughs> live world, right? And, and that's, I think, something that we sometimes need to remind ourselves when we talk about people and culture, company culture, that not so many things change uh, or are changing actually yeah so and and i think this sometimes also help if we're like surrounded by all this chaos we talked about earlier to kind of really think about okay what 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 is it that is some sort of, sort of also stable yeah and if i think really about company culture there are elements like okay we have our work environment right and and these other colleagues obviously and then there is a difference if you see them may, maybe every day where you sit next to each other but i've been for example myself i've been working in global roles uh, since I started my career, I'm now for the first time in a regional role where I have my people around me. Mm. And during all these first years, I also had to build relationships with my colleagues all over the world. Mm-hmm. And I never felt detached. Mm. So I think we kind of need to think about the topics. Hmm, how, what do we do in order to yeah. c- create this connection? And you can create relationships. You can create um, a sort of um, um, a common vision, common goals, mm-hmm. which is necessary in order to create a company culture that thrives. Mm-hmm. This is something you need to do like if you're in a live setup, I'm calling it live setup now. Yeah. But it's also the case when you're working like digitally everywhere. So it's, yeah. it's the values you need to create this common common vision. Vision You need to find a way that people are like, oh yeah, hell yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 be, I stand behind that and I'm gonna transport this into the organization and you have the work environment with the colleagues that are supporting each other. Then you have the environment where you can make an impact like mm-hmm. we also say at Henkel, at Henkel we say dare to make an impact. But mm-hmm. So you really want to make, we ha- you want to have the possibility to make changes in the organization. It's yeah. about the leaders. It's about also attracting the right people to the organization so that this company culture doesn't get a crush. Absolutely, yeah. definitely. And I think that as much as like the company culture part is, is more difficult than it was because it's just a lot of more different details that you have to mm-hmm. look at. I think that we're in front of a great opportunity that companies have to really like invest in their culture and have a great company culture because Mm -hmm. we've got used to things that we never thought we'd get used to absolutely and if we have leaders that are as you said dora able to set a vision and then delegate and have people like that are actively involved i think we're going into i think you mentioned before one of you two about more projects and so on i think that's the work of the future right and i think this is the the what i'm hearing from both of you is that 
company culture is still going to be important in the future as it creates this kind of sense of ownership mm. and oneness. But the means by which you get to it might now change because you have a digital environment yeah. and you have the live environment mm -hmm. and both of them somehow play a role. And maybe more than before, digital is becoming more important. Yeah. So my next question actually would be a very open one. How important is the social media platform mm -hmm. for recruitment, both in the top uh, management sphere as well as the entry sphere? So mm -hmm. I would start with you, Doro, to yeah. give us a you know context from across the board. And then, Daniel, for you to also give us for the top management. Yeah. So the very short and easy answer is it's super important. Mm -hmm. Does it overtake the current way in which we're and don't get me wrong, uh, platforms like Zinc and LinkedIn. Yes, they are social, uh, but I still consider them separate from like social media like TikTok and mm -hmm. Facebook and uh, Instagram and these things. So yep. if you were to differentiate between these two, yep. how does the social platforms of TikTok and uh, Instagram yeah. uh, appear in our hiring process. Both of them are super important in the attraction and also in the hiring mm. process. And then you need to deviate a little bit when it comes to, of course, attracting different kinds of people, like you were saying mm. later. I think we have the very interesting situation that we have now. I mean, it doesn't matter in which year we are, we always have different generations. Yeah. But now there is some, there's a new generation on the rise, the Generation Z, and um, I mean, there's lots of conversations about Generation Z and also why, and due to the fact that they are somehow triggering also changes and, mm. and they come in with some some ideas and, and sometimes it feels like more demands. Oh. And, 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 and I think this is something that is reflected very well also in the social media world. So yes, we use LinkedIn and we use Xing, of course. It's a super important platform for us in order to talk about what Henkel is doing and also, of course, to, to get in touch with people, people on a professional level. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like you mentioned already, Instagram and TikTok, super important because this is where, when I'm thinking now, for example, about the younger generation, the generation that I was talking about, mm -hmm. This is where they are and if we want to reach people and, and this is in talent attraction it's also i would say procedure in marketing mm -hmm. you need to understand your audience you yeah. need to understand uh, who is this person you want to get for your company where do they spend their time and if we look at the younger generations they spend most of their time online and they spend tons of hours every week on social media and, and especially on TikTok and Absolutely. Instagram. So we need to be there mm -hmm. as an organization, but we also need to think about how we kind of wrap it up. How do we wrap up our content in order to make it appeal? We cannot, what we do on LinkedIn and Zing doesn't work on TikTok and, and Instagram. Yeah. But we, you still need to have your own appeal yes. so that you don't lose yourself, but still position yourself for that particular yeah. platform you need to be authentic authentic this That's is the what, right um, what the the generation z and i think they are also <laughs> sometimes called bullshit detectors yeah. <laughs> detectives maybe even they immediately will find out if this is if it's not in line with with your values yeah. if it's not in line with if you're your greenwashing purpose. something exactly. or you're yeah. not being true to yourself yeah. that's so true if yeah. you want to reach the younger generation especially uh, you somehow need to get naked and yeah. You need to be very true to yourself hmm. and you need to be very honest because present otherwise, yourself to them. Exactly. Otherwise, they will be like, OK, go on to the next channel. Absolutely. Okay. And, the, you know, the attention span, as they say, it's not just for the younger generation. It's even for us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We're hooked to short format. So yeah. how does social uh, play into the role for corporate hiring mm. process? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, in that level, it's still very much about companies being open and communicating like via the more classical mm -hmm. corporate channels, if you like. So having like, you know, when they do quarterly announcements, present them in mm -hmm. the right way, have like a CEO that, that, that that's out there and has a public image. LinkedIn is very important. Mm -hmm. So having that public presence on those networks is what's important to... To be kind of like a role model and a leader perhaps in that mm -hmm. sphere? That helps, having okay. like a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, although... I have to say that I think that in the last couple of years, that's maybe not as important as it was for some reason. I feel like pre-pandemic purpose was mm -hmm. a lot of what companies spoke mm -hmm. about. Now I think we're going into a bit of a weird transition period, but I think that the fundamentals are the same, like being present, having like great brands, having great people, 
and having good results ultimately mm-hmm. will be you know what I've seen? Attract people. one of the things that I've noticed while surfing these um, professional social channels like mm-hmm. Zinc and LinkedIn mm-hmm. is that the top management the moment they become more personal and they start sharing their real life situations I feel a connection to them and mm-hmm. I want to follow them mm-hmm. yeah and you see a very few of them are doing this. Most of them are curating their content or having their team curate something for them. Hmm. So this, I don't know, it's an appeal for me. And the question is, do you think that uh, having that kind of, like you said, being naked in front of the world, does that also play for the top management, the CEOs, the COOs? Do they need to be more human on the these kind of platforms or do they still need to keep it professional? And I open it to both of you. So I think that being there already is important, even mm-hmm. if it's in a more corporate manner. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's it's good to be genuine and it and it and it and it's a positive thing, but it is a risk you run. I have to mm-hmm. say. So you're yeah. gonna piss off someone. Not piss off, but it can look it, like being trying to be genuine can look non genuine. And when ah, you're talking okay. out, and especially when you're talking out CEOs. Which in general are not the most extroverted people. Yeah. In these exceptions, but in general they're more mm-hmm. introverted, reserved. It can feel non genuine. So if they do it in a corporate way, even if it's more states, in some way it feels more genuine. Yeah. Um, I think that it goes again to the fundamental of like showing what you're doing and having a, some certain vision. Maybe showing that visibility yeah. of it. What do you think, Dora? Yeah, I, I I think this is really an interesting perspective, also, Daniel. I'm. And I fully agree to the part where you say also the CEO, I mean, is, is representing the company. It's, it's the person that represents the company probably the most, right? And, and the person while doing the representation needs to be, needs to feel comfortable and needs to be also authentic in, in what the person does. I think even though if the CEO doesn't like it so much, I think <laughs> um, the CEO in order to survive also in this world and not to also from a talent perspective attract uh, people, you cannot yeah. only rely on your employer reputation teams, mm, yeah. but you also need to do your fair share. Yeah. And this is by contribution, going, by contribution, by mm. going out there and talking also on the more or less personal channels, even though we know, of course, there might be a team behind supporting, but then the CEO can find himself or herself a team where um, mm. the where the team kind of really helps the CEO to get out this authentic yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. real self. Authentic self. And you yeah. need to put yourself out because people like people, people follow people. You just said it, yeah, Adil. Absolutely. You're following someone because you feel a connection. Absolutely. And not a company. I mean, I also have a connection to a company and their brands where when there are brands out there will meet it like yeah. mm, nice. But like when you really have this, okay, I follow this. This mm. is always people. We yeah. always follow people. So it's the CEO, but it's not only the CEO. Mm-hmm. As an organization, you need to find ways. And if we have a good company culture, and if people are engaged, and if people are all in, so to say, yeah. then they will also find it easier to go out yeah. and share and spread the word about the organization Absolutely. through what they're doing. So it's yeah. not about yellow washing or anything. I mean, yeah, no. and, and this, this is please. sorry. There's another point actually that why it's a good idea for senior dire, for yeah. senior executives and even junior executives. I know yeah. some junior people that are like brand managers that do a lot and have mm-hmm. built their own image. Apart from, from a talent attraction point of view, it's great for them. It's yeah. great investment for them because they get well known in the industry, great opportunities at an executive level, and most importantly, for the future at a non-executive level. Yeah, and maybe even building leadership skills at an early age. So, yeah. you know, you're getting that really out there. And um, one of the things that I've noticed uh, in the recent um, years is that when I was growing up, the vision was apply for an FMCG, right? That is the kind of job you need, mm. uh, either apply to a bank or an FMCG. But today I see that the younger generation is not necessarily looking for an FMCG kind of uh, position or a job. They're actually in it to enjoy themselves. And then the question arises, how do organizations that are mammoth FMCGs like Henkel and others in its uh, industry compete with the smaller organizations, the unicorns or the startups. Mm. Where do you think, is there actually a competition between the two to uh, attract the same kind of uh, talent or are the talents, uh, talent pools completely different? Mm-hmm. At, a, at a graduate level, for sure. I mean, it's the same. 
I mean, yeah, I mean, smart people when they go out of co- with out of mm-hmm. university without any experience, they'll apply to like the companies that have the most appeal mm-hmm. from a generic level, mm-hmm. unless they have very clear that they want to be in an in account management, calling okay. on a supermarket, yeah. which probably doesn't ever happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so from that level, yes. Then at a more advanced level, it depends on the function, right? So for example, supply chain, obviously a lot of FMCG retail companies are feeling the pressure, have felt the pressure from Amazon, for example, mm-hmm. which has a lot of money and can hire a lot of people and compete for that type of talent. Or in finance, they felt the pressure from fintech. Mm. But when you go into sales and marketing, for example, it's quite industry specific. Um, right. And uh, actually, I think if you look at it, there is a lot of cross category uh, pollinization as well, because I've seen people going from the FMCG industry into organizations that are digital uh, relevant, like Meta, mm. because they also need the relevance of this industry over there. So. At some level, I think there is this overlap that tends to take mm. place. But for us within Henkel, Doro, do you see this as a challenge that has happened not only at a starting level, which uh, Daniel has mentioned, but also mid and upper tier? Mm. Yeah, I mean, in, I think in the end, it comes down to the attractiveness uh, as, as an employer as such, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and you just touched on, on, on the graduate perspective, and I, I, I know fully... Um, support this also based on studies that we look at on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So when, when people go out of university and they get like questionnaires, where do you want to work? And then they usually name one of the big companies like Henkel. So it's it's often less the, the, the startups maybe. Mm-hmm. But in the end, I wouldn't say that there is much of a competition because they're so different. Their advantages to be working in a startup environment and their mm-hmm. advantages to be working in, in a corporate environment like Henkel. And, and then back to your question, Adil, employer attractiveness okay what does this mean i mean on the one hand we have like an employer brand um and which is also um uh, influenced by by the corporate brand as such do i work for a company that is innovative do i work for a company that has prestige Um, these are elements that are super important to people who are looking for a job and of course that will rise across the generation and also across the seniority level then you have that's the topic that we talked earlier about people and culture how is the environment how is all of that? Then we have also a topic of when it's about remuneration, for example. It also comes down to money in the end. How much money yes. do I get? What are the benefits? Um, yeah. What? Yeah. How do I? How do I? Um, how am I treated in terms of my personal development? Do I have an environment where I can grow, where I can mm. shine, where people let me shine? True. And these are things that you can, for example, at Henkel do. It's mm-hmm. it's of course our challenge to get this across. To, to the people. And of course, I would be lying if I would say, ah, oh, this is easy peasy and a walk <laughs> in the park. And no, because I mean, we have great resignation out there. It's, it's this wave True. is like coming from, from all over the world. Yeah. I think it started in the US. Then we have a shortage of skilled labor and everybody's fighting for them. So I think for, for companies all around the world and, and also for a company like Henke, and that's what we're doing is we really uh, get ourselves out there. We try um, to show who we are. We mm-hmm. try to present us in an authentic way and show the cool stuff that Henke is providing. And we talked earlier about our smart work arrangements, which Correct. is not just about the mobile working, but also other elements. And yeah, so much more, obviously. Correct. Um, I want to shift gears a bit and talk about uh, generational gaps when yeah. it comes to hiring. Um, Every era has seen a generation gap, but I feel that (laughs) now in a span of a decade, you have maybe four generations, uh, whereas you may have had only one generation gap in the past. Does this generational gap impact the way in which hiring is offered and even accepted within the workplace? Well, you know that this generational gap thing that's like They've got like um, Egyptian writings that already talk about <laughs> all the people, picks. all the people saying, "Oh, the young people of today are not like us." <laughs> so that's all. That's kind of always existed. But mm-hmm. what's pretty amazing is that when I think we, Dora and you, we we started working more or less at the same time, it, it was all about millennials, right? So, mm-hmm. oh, how do we get millennials to yeah. engage and so on? Then in 2020, we all went home for a while. And when we went back to the office, now it's all about Gen Z, right? Yeah. So I think that every generation has its has its nuances and its unique challenges. I just think that now the world is just this, as we've said, there's a lot going on. 
So it's just like another element of, of, of disruption, if you like. Yeah. So, yeah. and yeah, so it's, it's pretty fascinating, right? And is the company or are the companies actually realizing that this is a new challenge that they have to wrap themselves around yeah. or some are slower than others? I hope they do. Yeah, yeah I, I hope, hope so, right? Because yeah. I mean, the topics I just mentioned, like the shortage of skilled labor, yeah. great resignation. So people, the tendency is higher for people to, oh, I'm just going to change. And hmm. since people do this with more ease. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. Whereas, respect the, the loyalty topic. I don't know if it's all about loyalty, but it was more normal to stay for a long time with a company. And now it's, it's also like socially accepted and it's yeah. also accepted with recruiters, right? Mm -hmm. I, I remember years ago, I think I, maybe Daniel, I would be interested in that because uh -huh. I think um, years ago, if you would have like jumps in your resume, people would be like, oh, oh they exactly. don't hire that person. But yeah. this, this changed, it's, right? It's changed and yeah. it's also changed like to have entrepreneurial experience. Before yeah. we're like, why did that person go to a small company? Yeah. Now it's all, they went to a small company. Yeah. That's <laughs> wow. agile. Um, yeah. But I think that also, mm, yeah, I don't know, like there's a difference between like millennials and, and Gen Z in the way, yeah. I think that Gen Z is a bit more different than we were in some way. I, I think that they're more accepting of challenge. They, the, is that something that you've noticed that the Gen Z is willing to take more risk? I think they're more outspoken. Outspoken. And, and also in their yeah. wishes, so, um, which I admire, actually. Yeah. And I think we, we, I mean, when I say we, the millennials, um, <laughs> I think we also have uh, components to it. But if I would compare it, like also in a, in a job interview, I mean, from a millennial perspective, I mean, uh, it was like, oh, you, you got an interview, oh, wow. And then you wasn't, yeah. we were in the interview. And then if Daniel, if you would have asked me if I was willing to do X, Y, Z, I would have said, yeah, of course, so. just just to get into <laughs> And the Gen Z is like, no, maybe um, they're so setting some boundaries. There's one essential difference, which yeah. is what I wanted to say before, mm -hmm. I forgot, which is, I think, very important is that when, when you and me went into the workforce, we we're coming from a global recession. Yeah, and which when we were studying, we couldn't take for granted that we would have yeah, a great job. Yeah. So I think that everyone was like, wow, got a job. So let's you give it took all. whatever yeah. you got. This first I think of we all, didn't do bad. Yeah, you? no, no, that's <laughs> great. We did okay. I think you did great, but this just makes me realize how old I am. Because, <laughs> because that was I, the elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm much before that recession and I'm thinking, oh my God. I have like two, three recessions to think about in my uh, well, that's the thing, time. Right? I think that the generation that's now coming into the workforce is coming out of 10 years mm -hmm. of, uh, at least in the West, of economic bonanza, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even, through the co even through COVID, apart from like some specific sectors, yeah. in consumer goods, it's been quite well. And the economy in general has been strong and the labor market has been strong. And you know what I've noticed is that there are more entrepreneurial opportunities mm -hmm. out there now with the digital space than there were maybe back then. So anybody who has a sense for creativity can become a social media manager or can pick up a camera and do something, learn something mm -hmm. on the side. You didn't have the opportunities to learn so much in the mm -hmm. past. Everything you had to pay for. Now, I mean, YouTube is like your new library. And I have seen kids mm -hmm. at the age of maybe 10 or 11 that make epic editing, co edited content. So they're also more entrepreneurial in the way in which they approach life because yeah. they're like, okay, if I have a steady job, then I'm forsaking this that I could do on the yeah. side. So with these kind of uh, mindset that you have for the younger generation, does it make it difficult to hire for uh, a nine to five kind of job? Or do you have to change the way in which you have to approach these uh, talents? Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. The nine to five mentality. Mm -hmm. I think this is somehow, it somehow, it it's doesn't a, exist anymore. It's more like eight. To se it's more like eight to seven in general. Yeah. I think <laughs> because, I, because what you're talking about is like standard working times, Correct. right? So this is okay. I'm starting then. I'm. I'm. I'm then it's time for me to go to my family to yeah. do whatever I want to do. Or if maybe I don't have a family, but I have other hobbies yeah. or whatsoever. Yeah. And I think, I mean the. 
the digitalization provides us the opportunities that we have all this flexibility we were talking about earlier. And the talents, they're also demanding this kind of flexibility. At the same time, I also see that people, um, when it then comes to, of course, dealing with mental load and everything, there needs to be a way to put some boundaries to it and to also find ways to be offline every now and then. Yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily about a nine to five mentality, but it's really about um, finding a way to serve through this endless opportunities, because True. in the end, these are endless opportunities. But also, I think we are still, and also I sometimes have the feeling that this is a threat throughout the generations. We still need to find ourselves so that we, we are, because in the end, we are humans, mm -hmm. we're not robots. There's this digital work around, world around us. We mm. have artificial intelligence. We have so many new technological solutions, but our brain didn't develop that yeah. way. Our yeah. brain is still old, if I um, And I, I get scared when I see AI. <laughs> I, I get yeah. scared, I have to say. Um, the question that then arises is, is it still today an employer's market or an employee market when it comes to the job market? I think that broadly speaking, right now it's an, an employer. An employee, mar an employee market in the mm -hmm. way that there's more demand for workers than workers available. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the case throughout the advanced economies in general. Yeah. Um, But then there are also boundaries in which, you know, the, the barriers to entry to this economy, you know. Mm -hmm. the, I know that there are people within the subcontinent, within the rest of Asia, that would be fabulous for the opportunities here, but they can't enter. Right. Hmm. So is that something that we've also somehow created ourselves because of political scenarios? Hmm. Uh, I think it's um, when we talk about the, we, this is because we're talking about shortage of labor. Right. Yes. And we have like this, this small pool and everybody is trying to get somebody out of this pool. So we have so yeah. many employers who are liking who, who try to fish in the employee market, like you said, uh, Daniel. So I think at some point we need to think about so many things and, and not just at some point. So the time is now. It's, a, it's about really thinking, how can I utilize the power that we have? And this is also a topic for, for diversity, equity and inclusion. Let me yeah. ask you one question then. Um, broadly speaking, what would be the top one or two things that HR needs to focus on in this day and age uh, for an organization? Ideally, you're asking me an impossible question. <laughs> it's, just, it's not just one or two things. It's like it's the so few much, things seen or something. So, yeah. so what are the few more. things that come to your it's mind? It's so much more. But I mean, I, I wanted to elaborate a bit on the on the role of DNI earlier, and mm -hmm. this would be one of my top list as you yeah. were asking me. What would be DNI? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. Because if we think and, and just making the, the the bridge again back to the short, shortage of labor. Because there is still so much untapped potential also mm -hmm. within the workforce that we have. And when I think just about one dimension of diversity, equity and inclusion, which is which is gender. Mm -hmm. And we see um, um, in certain uh, positions, there are less and less uh, female workers. And uh, this is sometimes due to um, the, the challenges that we have to combine family and, and work with each other. And at this moment, still, a lot of women are taking this load, so to say, mm -hmm. on their shoulders. If we as organizations find better ways to provide everybody opportunities to, to be a part in the party, so to say, mm -hmm. this is already something that could help, of course, make sure that everybody can keep working, so to say, if the person wants to. So mm -hmm. just one example also to, to bring in another dimension and the DNI dimension in this particular deep dive with gender. I mean, DNI is so much more, but it's also about, and you said, um, that we also need to get people from other countries. Mm -hmm. This is for mm -hmm. me the same. We need to be all part of diversity. It's part of the diversity. It's part of, of the internationality, ethnicity, where we need to bring in new perspective also from, mm -hmm. from this um, point of view. And when we have troubles, for example, I mean, I'm now based in Germany and also my focus is yeah. Germany and Switzerland. I'm like, okay, if we want to survive as, as a company, but also I think as a country, mm -hmm. we need to open up and we need to make sure that we can tap into all these awesome people all around the world and make sure that we have um, accessible, uh, that we make it accessible for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is actually, then let's push it out yeah. to your side as well. Diversity mm -hmm. as a means of hiring. Is this something that you're seeing more and more with your clientele? Or are they just saying, just get us the right person. We don't care about diversity. I hope not. I mean, like, that's the extreme <laughs> case. But, you know, just let's be honest. Well, what, it's not what as is extreme it? as you would think. Because okay. lots of times when, when I get engaged on a role, it's because uh, it's an urgent need. There's no talent inside. Mm -hmm. And 
the perception of very scarce talent outside. So if it's very specialized, maybe it's not the position to mm -hmm. prioritize diversity and inclusion because mm -hmm. you're looking for a very specific skill set. Yeah. I would say that if you want to prioritize diversity and inclusion, it's not a quick fix mm -hmm. for once. Mm -hmm. And for second, it's like you need to do talent pipelining and really do an intentional mid to long term effort to bring great people. So, for example, for a multinational like Hinkle with many business units, really like from the moment that you hire people, make sure it's the people that have the ambition to move internationally and, okay. to, and to be internationally mobile. Invest money into that because moving people is expensive. And then, then also have like, yeah, have that culture in it and allow like mothers to actually continue engaged in work mm -hmm. and not like co disconnect or you have to like kind of hire people like that and be very intentional about it. And that's why when you do have a company culture, as it's all related to culture at the end, mm -hmm. yeah, you need to have a culture that is very clear and that's not for everybody as okay. well. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you've worked with organizations big and small and mm -hmm. maybe even startups, am mm -hmm. I right? More like mid-sized and mid large. Mid-sized and large. Yeah. Um, do you see a difference in terms of the importance of diversity between them? Like the bigger the organization, the more open to diverse uh, diversity they are? In general, and without making it a rule of thumb, the bigger the organization, the more progressive they are in these aspects and more intentional they are. Mm -hmm. Also because they have a bigger talent bench. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when they hire for diversity, they can do it more intentionally. Yeah, and over here, then that actually brings me to that point that Henkel being so big, um, it is already very good when it comes to diversity topics and inclusion. But do you see areas within this that you would like to focus on in the next couple of months and years? I think when it comes to like managing diversity and mm -hmm. equity and inclusion, which is what we of course try from an, from an organizational perspective or what I also try, um, I think it's really important to take a holistic view at diversity, equity and inclusion. So really thinking about the broad spectrum of dimensions. And I touched on the dimension of gender earlier and then a little bit on ethnicity and internationality, but it's also about generations. So the third dimension, I just realized we also already touched upon. And this, mm -hmm. I think, already shows mm -hmm. that it's really it's really a very it's 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 like a wheel. It's, it's all somehow needs to be connected. It all needs to flow into each other. There are other dimensions like also people with disabilities. We have uh, different sexual orientations. And I think all of this brings such a wonderful diversity. And we need to make sure that we connect all of this. And it's not always possible to do everything at the same time. Like we're also not able to do this in the business. But I think it's important to be aware about all these dimensions and to be aware of where we stand as an organization or for other organizations where they stand yeah. and then see what can I do in order to make this picture complete? And then there might be some dimensions where you see, okay, there may be some low-hanging fruits. Maybe there are some mm -hmm. topics um, I can do right now. Maybe there are some things I need to invest a little bit more time. And then, of course, there would be some elements where you say, hey, this is for us so important. And for Henkel, it's, it's, it's um, I mean, again, also all the dimensions are very important, but it's really gender. And, and, and an example would be the gender parity ambition that uh, Henkel right. also published mm -hmm. last year to achieve gender parity across all management positions as one example. Mm, excellent. And it's, and it's difficult to, the diversity topic, because like we're talking about culture as well, that it needs to be something clear and not for everybody. So how do you get that together yeah. with having people of many walks of life, right? So it is a challenge and it's something that we have to keep on working on all the time. Uh, and, you know, diversity and culture are kind of like two sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. but that coin, the currency is uh, the person itself, the personality. And the how ways do you of judge how you it? communicate exactly. and so on. Yeah. So within, an, uh, let's say, hiring process, what would be the way in which you identify the right personality for uh, an organization? What would you do? Yeah, normally, like, I use a lot of, like, benchmarking. Like, depends on when the, where the person comes from. Like, if they're happy or, like, for example, I'm working with a company that's not very structured and people have to be self-starters. So if I'm interviewing somebody for a company that's very structured, mm. if they're happy there and they like that culture, I know that they won't be happy at my client. Mm. Whereas if they're there, but they feel frustrated by the process, I know they'll be happy there. Interesting. Yeah. So it's also a base on 
you understanding the company. That's important. Yeah. And then asking the right questions to filter. That's really interesting. I, I never thought of it uh, that way because I always thought of a hiring as a person to person topic rather than a company to person topic. Mm. So no, and the interview, I mean, the, the company has its set of values. We have a purpose, mm. we have a vision. And then there's a person with its own values and aspirations and everything. And of course, there needs to be some sort of a common ground in yeah. order to make it work. And I think it's important when we talk about bringing different perspectives and you can have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. This is appreciated. But there needs to be some sort of a common ground. And yeah. in, like, in, in hiring processes, this is, and like you said it, you, you do this by um, having questions, set of questions in order to find this out. But there are also tests like you can, there, is, there are tons of personality tests like the Myers-Briggs types indicator mm -hmm. or DISC and, and, and many more diagnostics that you can use. There are assessment centers that you can use in general. Yeah. So tons of opportunities. And what I find actually super interesting these days also, and I'm curious also, Daniel, how, how you see this and how you maybe use it already is the role of AI. I mean, to be That's honest, so, fascinating. So, so we are not at Henkel, we are not using it AI at this moment. Like we have, we have a chatbot. Yes. Um, but I mean, when it comes to like screening, filtering, um, filtering maybe asking the right, maybe questions. even doing the first interviews. I don't know. I find wow. it so fascinating and scary at the same time, <laughs> no. but I know it, it, it will be coming in some form. Right. And, and we need to get ready for this. It I depends mean. on what level you're hiring yeah. as well, because you're, if you're actually headhunting, yeah. You can't like expect people to like be speaking through a robot, yeah. right? You need to actually engage yeah. these people yeah. from moment one. And actually, that's very yeah. important for companies to know that as well. That in the recruitment process, it's not about the recruiter, it's not about HR, mm -hmm. it's about the line manager being involved and being personal with that person. And yes, that's totally. AI, I don't think, and I, I mean, won't ever replace that. If yeah. if AI is able to replace that, it means that people have. We've all become robots, basically. <laughs> I mean, at some level, if you think about it, we are very robotic in the way we but do still, things. I, but I, think, I still, still think that we're highly emotional. No, of course. Like, when you're talking about individual, like culture is based on individuals, you're completely right. Like in, in the end of the day, companies, people like people that they like, yeah. hire people that they like. And normally when a, when a company culture is very strong and solid, it's as simple as an indefinite, as indefinite as like, Oh yeah, we saw that person in the room and we very quickly saw that they were a culture fit or we quickly saw that they weren't. Yeah. And that happens and that that's actually in some way the ultimate way to see it. Yeah, and you know there are so many different uh, books out there and uh, topics. One of them was discussed by I think Malcolm Gladwell where he said that most of the decisions we take based on our checklist is mm -hmm. not necessarily valid because there is this in inherent way of looking at things which biases whatever we do. Hmm. So even the hiring process, the moment you automate it, I think it can get quite scary, you know, if you think about it, because you might be missing out on someone that the system believed was not relevant yep. on that particular day. It's a big challenge. Right? But it's an interesting and fascinating way of looking at it. And it brings me to my next question. The other day, you and I were discussing about whether or not um, Henkel would be willing to do video resumes. And you told me that just like maybe McDonald's, Henkel also does video resumes. Is yeah. that correct? Yes, of course. Oh, wow. So, I had no idea. Yes, our recruiting uh, department is very advanced. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so cool. <laughs> no, no. I mean, so, for example, what people are doing, they, they, they're they sending a link, for example, to the to the YouTube video. So people mm -hmm. do it on YouTube or they... Um, just via a QR code or something. That's amazing. And this is actually so much fun to be receiving these kind of um, um, applications. So, wow. I mean, I also do definitely recommend anybody, not necessary to only do a video application, but to do something that stands out. You something know, that differentiates th you. This is a, okay. I need to discuss this. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. So, I have created a resume for myself yeah. in the past, which was very colorful. Mm -hmm. And when I got to uh, Germany, I even wrote a post about it. And I got this a, a plethora of people saying, you know, in Germany, we like to do things a certain standard way oh, okay. right? with that one pager with the picture on the side or maybe no picture. Yeah. But, you know, you have this, this, this. I open this up to both of you. Yeah. When you see a resume, do you want to see a standard resume that's easy to uh, review quickly and you know that every resume will be in the same uh, way? Or do you want to see something yeah. different? What? I'll let you start, Daniel, because you probably <laughs> see way more resumes than I do. 
but I definitely mm-hmm. would like I've to seen, comment it. I've seen a few. I've seen a few. <laughs> Look, I think that in general, when you're talking, because I'm judging people, mm-hmm. like the f- resume for me is the first filter, and mm-hmm. and they need to be like have certain qualifications or certain experience basically because education to be honest i don't really look at it even Mm -hmm. Uh, so for me the most important is that person knows how to communicate what they've done and what they're about very clearly for me that's the most important thing because it's all if it's it's all about colors and emojis and stuff like that but it doesn't have any substance Mm -hmm. written substance okay and that's your starting point to say okay this is an interesting person for me to take on as a further mind the hiring managers and practically everyone like the, you need to appear to be yeah. smart and have an impact on your cv basically okay good yeah, and to build on this you need to in the end you need to bring your message across yeah okay you exactly. need to, i mean you want to present yourself as a person we have learned that i mean it's 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 a difficult situation right because we are in a in a situation where we are hungry for talents Mm -hmm. and where there are not so many talents out there at the same time of course we and and when i say we i'm I'm of course think from a hinkle perspective but as also in general from an organizational perspective i mean you still cannot take just anybody you need to have this cultural fit we were just talking about so um no matter how this looks like if it with with emojis without emojis if it's uh, colorful or not if it's a video or not that there needs to be a moment where the person is able through this resume and, and again the form doesn't matter but it needs to be quickly it needs to quickly transport who the person is and what okay. the person is good at and, and what he or she could bring to the table if, uh, for the new absolutely. job absolutely and there's a strong correlation you yeah. wouldn't believe how strong it is between someone that has a good resume and is a good interviewer and is actually good and a person with a bad resume and that's actually a bad interviewer and it's probably not that good like there's a super strong correlation it's unbelievable wow okay so this makes it even more interesting in this in day uh, day and age because you have so many different ways of connecting uh with the hiring manager Mm. i remember seeing a video where a person actually did a treasure hunt online for their resume so getting the hiring manager to actually get to the final point online of what their resume really is (laughs) Okay. I know that was a bold move, uh, but it was also an interesting treasure yeah. hunt on its own. I'm interested. Yeah, <laughs> so I would have I would have hired that creative kid. Yeah, yeah really cool. Um, really cool. The last uh, maybe one or two questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, same for both of you. First of all, do you think multinational companies are sexy employers? And if not, what can we do to make them sexy employers mm-hmm. again? So, Dora, what do you think? I mean, the first thing I would like to say, it's, it's always, I mean, this is highly personal, right? Mm-hmm. So it depends on, on what you're looking for. And I think I mentioned this earlier also that there are tons of advantages to work for a multinational company and there might be advantages to work for a smaller organization or a startup. And I mean, as I'm working for a multinational company, mm-hmm. um, what I like about it is, as an example, I mean, I'm 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 one of 52,000 employees yeah. all following one big purpose. Yeah. Pioneers at heart for the goods of generation. I mean, wow, right? And it's big. I mean knowing that there are so many of us out there in Germany we say Hinkelanos, right? Yeah. So at the beginning when I joined the organization I found it's a very odd term and then I I started to get to know people and I thought, "Oh, this is so cool. There's so much more behind it. It's innovation. It's it's people who are practical about it. It's people helping each other. It's, it's and a we team speak spirit. the same language. Same language, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you have that. Um, and, and for example, with the stuff I do, mm-hmm. I know, I mean, sometimes people could say, oh, you may be just a small person in the, in the wheel because of the size of the organization. But this is exactly not how I see it. Because when I do something, it immediately pe- impacts thousands of people Amazing. in our organization. And due to the fact that these people have friends and family, it goes even further. So if I support my organization in driving culture, in, in, in driving diversity, equity and inclusion, I know that it will also impact others. And then I'm like, wow. Amazing. And I think this is something, an example for the corporate world. And of course, there are things like sometimes we are in the middle of alignment process, etc. Mm-hmm. And, and you don't need to lie about this. The, they exist and you might not have this in smaller organizations. Mm, true. You can maybe do things even quicker. So there's always two sides of a coin that, as you said, Fair enough. but this would be something where I'm like, hell yeah. So <laughs> there is so that, cool. you know, energy yeah. that you get in uh, to an organization and then you feel part of yeah. something bigger. So yeah. 
what do you think, uh, Daniel? You've got experience from mid and large organizations. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's something that's right about working in consumer goods is that ultimately your the output is a product that makes people lives better in some way or another. Yeah. And you can relate to it and you yeah. can see it, which I think is something really cool about that, this yeah. industry. No, and I think that working in a multinational, I mean, you get to do big things, as you were saying, yeah. you have budget, you have scale, you work with, you work with very smart people. Mm -hmm. That's something that like, as somebody that's never worked in a big multinational, I'm kind of jealous about it. Right? <laughs> no, because I'm a very social and extrovert person. So to be able to see people every day that are very smart, that inspire you, that you learn yeah. from, that's a great thing. And also if it's a multinational that's more, that's built well in the talent structure, you can learn a lot of things, work in different departments, live in different countries and make a good living. Absolutely. Maybe it's not going to be Mark Zuckerberg becoming a millionaire, but it's going to give you a very good fun fundamentals to do business as an entrepreneur, potentially as well. A lot of yeah, entrepreneurs so have worked place. in multinationals before. Exactly. So a good, let's say, breeding ground for maybe future entrepreneurs that can make a change in the you know, work and environment. So with that, guys, I want to thank you for an hour that passed like that. And I didn't even great. realize it. That yeah, really no was. Kidding. Yeah. So uh, I know you guys must be really tired, especially uh, Daniel, you traveling, um, you know, early morning. When did you get up? I woke up at the time that I go to sleep on weekends oh at my 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's time for us to probably take a break. We thank everybody for listening in. Um, treat is on me. I'll treat you guys to some coffee. What do you say we head out then? Sounds Perfect. good. All right, so let's go.